I'm Paul Page, and this is The Skinny. From the Fatheads Eyewear Studios in Speedway, Indiana, this is The Skinny. Brought to you by Toyota, Rhino Classifieds, General Tire, and Dream Giveaway. This segment of The Skinny is brought to you by Rhino Classifieds. Tired of all those ads and random stuff that shows up when you're looking to buy or sell your car parts? Rhino Classifieds was created just for you. Welcome to a streamlined buying and selling app created by racers for racers and race fans. Modified cars, classic cars, race cars, that special big block you need, the trailer to move your baby around the country in. We got you at rhino.co. Welcome to the skinny. Part two, actually, of the skinny as Paul Page is in the studio with us. Ken Stout, Michael Young, we call him the track dude, is in sitting in for Rico here. And uh, we've had some great conversation. If you did not hear part one, make sure you search it out. Great stuff in there from one of the legendary broadcasters of our time. Chief announcer for IMS Radio. Chief announcer at, uh, at ABC has done multiple IndyCar races, certainly iconic when it comes to the sounds of the Indianapolis 500, a two-time Grammy winner. It goes on and on and on. Paul Page, ladies and gentlemen, in with us. Thanks for taking the time here and, and spending enough time for us to actually get a couple of shows out of him. You know you're busy. He actually is uh, on his way to Wait, Android. Do, do so I get paid sure for a couple of, of shows? Am I, am I going to get paid for those? Uh, yeah, that check is in the mail, yeah. as they say. <laughs> Three times zero is still zero, isn't it? <laughs> No commas, by the way. <laughs> hey, um, you've been in this industry for so long, and we all know what it's like to be in this industry and make some blunders. Does anything come to mind? Was there, was there a big moment where you're like, oh, my goodness, I can't believe I just did that? That comes to mind. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, the most memorable isn't that big a, a deal in, in today's world. Um, it was actually my, my first qualifying show. Uh, no, it was actually the, um, during the first race, I'm doing a lineup, you know, and at that time the, the deal was you had to do it slow because people are writing it down at home and you have to give, and they want all the information. Um, so, um, as I'm going through that, I'm getting kind of bored and I have it on a, uh, piece of, uh, a paper that's on the glass on the back of the booth. Um, and I, uh, now I'm, I'm bored and I'm doing what I'm doing now, which is just kind of, you know, reading and reading. And so, um, I get down to Danny on Gaius. Now, so we've been reading like AJ Foyt, number 14, the Sheridan Thompson special and Danny on Gaius. The intercourse, interscope oh, racing yeah. schedule. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, and that woke me back up. <laughs> yeah. But uh, focus, focus. Yeah, there's uh, there's there's a few like that. You really have to be careful when you're going fast and use the word pole sitter. Yes. Um, <laughs> and that's it. <laughs> I'm not telling you anymore. <laughs> yeah, I, I dug myself uh, into a hole. Uh, Corey Weller is a female racer in short course off-road, and she's very good. She's won multiple, multiple championships. And I was hosting a, a deal for Lucas Oil at the PRI show, and she happened to be in there. I happened to catch her inside of the, uh, inside of the crowd. And so as I was doing whatever it was, I was talking about the different uh, series that, that Lucas Oil owned and uh, representing them you know, to, the, to the people that were inside of the room. And I said, by the way, joining us is Corey Weller, who has sat on the pole eight times, you know? And I'm like, oh, boy. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> and, and I have Forrest Lucas sitting on the left side of me. Yeah. And I have Bob Pattison, senior vice president, <laughs> sitting on the right side of me. <laughs> and I looked at her, and, I, and, and now I'm trying to find a way out, right? I'm like, let me rephrase that. Well, as soon as I do that, now everybody thinks about it, you know? Mm -hmm. And I try to come up with another way to say it, and invariably, it doesn't help. It, it only makes it worse. And at some point, I looked over at Forrest Lucas, and he looks up at me, and he says, 
the best way to get out of a hole is to stop digging. <laughs> <laughs> He's right. Well, I was like, you know what? I'm going to end it right here. Corey Weller's a championship uh, racer. Great to have her with us. You know? that, that, you're, he's right, though. Uh, generally, you just kind of go ahead and hope that the audience thinks it was something in transmission and it wasn't, wasn't you that said that. In my, in my first race, remember the uh, John Cock, the entire Big Naughty group, Patrick Racing, had, uh, had kept their livery over from the SPD, STP days with bright, bright color. And I referred to that color, uh, which is called Dago Red. I called it Dago Red. That's an issue. So, so I, issue. I, I just, issue. I just kept on. I was, you're right. But, Don't. Irish had no problem with but, it. But what's, yeah. What's, but, it, what's interesting is when in broadcasting and as broadcasters, I think it's, and you do such a masterful job of just presenting yourself. It's the one bit of advice I think was given to me and it may have been you if you make a mistake don't dwell on it because yeah. Yeah. nine times out of ten people don't even realize you had right. said it but if you sit and beat yourself up over it that's when you end up making more mistakes and it, it's just yeah. never good as a broadcaster and it's uh, hard to uh, do. Unless, unless of course it's something really offensive uh <laughs> terrible language or something uh in which case you'd need to apologize yeah. right away um I did that it wasn't mine. Uh, we we were doing a race on ABC, and somebody spun and hit the wall. And this is like the nicest guy in the world. Uh, always was polite. Never never said a bad thing. So they left his radio up, and the next thing that comes is a horribly bad word. And it's like, I don't. I bet that's the first time that guy's ever said that. But naturally, I just say, well, we apologize for that. Yeah. But uh, yeah. No, most of the time, just keep rolling and hope nobody hears it. <laughs> you, you started in such a, a an amazing time, and we look back, especially in Indianapolis, with the Tom Carnegies of the world, yeah. the Sid Collins of the world, yourself included in that, and, and then on the latter end of that, Bob Jenkins and what he did. But it was such a special time that I don't want to say we'll never see those types of personalities again, but it was at a time... I don't know if there will ever be another Tom Carnegie just because the way things happen at any racetrack has changed. That well, you have video monitors now, that you have inst instant information in your hand with your phone, right. that the role of a public address announcer or a radio announcer has changed immensely from when you started right. and what you've seen. Well, uh, start with what you just suggested, the technology. <clears throat> When I started and took over from Sid in uh, 77, um, we didn't have computer scoring. Everything was hand scored. We didn't have any monitor of what was going on the rest of the track, so we relied more than ever on what they, the guys in the corners were feeding us, both on the air and off the air. The only piece of technology we had was I had a button that I could push and be talking to the guys off the air, and the same token, they could contact me off the air, and I'd hear them in one ear. Um, that was it. So uh, trying to figure out who was leading at any one time occasionally became an issue, especially after their recycling from pit stops, stuff like that. But with regard to, to Tom and, and to Sid, um, the word iconic is, is properly used here. Carnegie created a whole new form of public address. And he, too, understood, as we talked about in an earlier show, the, the beauty of silence. I mean, he really knew how to play it. I was talking to him once, so just, I was asking him about how he approached things and that. And, and we're pretty good friends. Um, and he said, you know, if it's really getting quiet, though, and the race is not doing much, then all I have to do is say, where's Mario? And the crowd's on its feet. You know, he's, I know Mario's on the back stretch, but it, <laughs> it gets him up. You knew the hook line. Yeah, and, and Sid, the, Sid created something that wasn't possible. Um, in 1952, when Sid got the radio network going as a bona fide, let's cover the race radio network, uh, the technology didn't really exist to do what he, what he did. Uh, they had to build special little consoles for each turn, had to send an engineer to the turn with them. There was no satellite. So each and every station that came on the network, and at that time it was over a thousand, had to be individually created with a ATT long lines to that, that station. Whereas today, you, you put them on a satellite, everybody's got it, we're good, move on. Um, and 
the the way that he contrived to put the announcers out and to get reports from the corners. I mean, it was it was astonishing what he put together. And, and what to me gets me the most is even once he created it, we didn't have the people to do it. So Sid's solution was to go to the local radio stations and say, hey, I'm doing this, going to be a big thing. First of all, we'll deliver it to you at no cost, but also we want to use your guys. And so that became a group of Indiana broadcasters coming together to do something really special. Uh, I don't think many personalities other than Sid could have actually gotten that done. So in that, in that role alone, he was truly remarkable. And he created the nature of how motorsports is called even to today. Um, I, I, don't, I can't imagine sitting down at that microphone to do a 500-mile race and not having the exact idea of how I was going to do it. Sid would have. Sid would have thought that thing through completely. And, you know, the first races he had a handheld big RCA microphone, and then later he had a, a wire a, a coat hanger around his neck with a microphone stuck in it. They, we didn't have headsets in those days. And so he was evolving not only the coverage of the Indianapolis 500, but what would be the future of the coverage of a lot of major sports. So intriguing to hear how things actually were created and developed back in the day, and this guy was all a part of it. We're going to take a quick break here. We have plenty more to go with Paul Page. This segment of The Skinny is brought to you by Toyota. This segment of The Skinny is brought to you by Dream Giveaway. Dream Giveaway has been giving away high-end American muscle cars to raise money for charities since 2007. Dream Giveaway is known for giving away classic and new muscle and paying the federal taxes so the winners don't have to. For $25, you can jump in the game, and part of that goes to charity. You'll have a chance at winning some of the coolest cars on the planet. Check it out at dreamgiveaway.com. Once again, welcome back to the Skinny Ken Stout. Michael Young and Paul Page is in here with us. And boy, are we learning a lot about how the industry has developed over the course of time. Of course, uh, these guys are magical with their words whenever we think about <laughs> a Paul Page. And, and I say that with absolute respect as, as a broadcaster. I look at you, you guys because there's really no school to teach us how to do it. We have to listen to ourselves. We have to watch the ones that we think are doing it good right. and then try to pick up some, some tips from them. And one of the toughest parts of our job, at least for me anyways, uh, and something I always look to people like you at, was how to cover a catastrophic mm. situation. Uh, you're covering the Indianapolis 500 or whatever race it may be, an NHRA race, if you will, uh, and and a racer has a, a huge crash, and there's a death. And you're on the air, and you're live, and you have to cover that. And you have to find those words to make it somehow acceptable, if you will. Not okay, but acceptable. And that's where I think people like you really shine. You wonder, how does somebody make it onto ABC? How do they get on those top three or four networks and it was moments like that where I would watch people like you and say, I need to learn how to handle that because I don't know, I don't know that I can handle that. Well, I, <clears throat> I learned how to do that, if learned is the word. Sid is, Sid Collins, universally famous for his eulogy after the Sachs McDonald accident. Now, Eddie Sachs is dead. And I, I touch on that whole thing in the book, but... Um, Sid had told me previous in-race fatalities he didn't cover well. In fact, the general, the general technique at the time would be to say so-and-so was fatally injured in an accident on the back straightaway, that was, and then move on. But with Sax McDonald, it was entirely different. He had well over an hour to think through what he was going to say. I mean, they knew he was dead right away. There was no, no question among the officials and everything. It was just... How long is it going to take us to get 
Nancy and everybody else notified properly. Um, and so Sid told me that he, later on, of course, told me, um, he prepared for that by having a small envelope that he gave me later labeled fatalities. And in it were pieces of poetry or little essay, some prose, something dealing with death. And his intent with that was to then pull out something he felt appropriate to that moment. Uh, for example, again in the Sax McDonald, they, uh, he used the piece from Byron. Um, and I understood that, but I, I, I changed it. I never felt in broadcasting a race that you had time um, to look at any notes. You know, even in the play-by-play -play call, you, 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 if you look down, something's going to happen when you look down. So um, I committed a lot of that to memory, to a little file in my brain. Um, and then, as, again, as you guys well know, it's a community, it's a family. You're all in it. They're all friends. Some of them are huge friends, but they're friends. They're your family. And so you kind of have to tailor all that together. And you have to think, I think, in my mind, that I am looking at one of those family members, and I'm explaining it as as best I can. And yeah, I was I had the misfortune to cover way too many of them, uh, and and live. Uh, Greg Moore was a, a live call, and uh, um, it's it's tough. Uh, had one in drag racing, Coletta. I mean, it just is. You gotta say you're talking to the family. That, that's the only way you can look at it and try and give some tribute and some meaning to what's just happened. In your life, and you have been in so many situations, not, but to some extent, Forrest Gumpish, that major events, and you were part of them, whether a large perspective mm -hmm. or small perspective, but the night that Martin Luther King and the, the news had been disseminated that that martin luther king had been assassinated mm -hmm. you were actually in indianapolis for a, a rather historic event yeah i was i was actually working as a stringer for wcfl in chicago at that time and uh, robert kennedy was going to come through and give a speech over on broadway about 19th and broadway and so i went over to cover it had my little recorder and everything put my mic up with everything else and then word came to us as the crowd starting to get together that Martin Luther King had been assassinated. Now, level of communications without, without cell phones and everything in those days was pretty, pretty slow, and the crowd didn't know it. Nobody came running in and saying, Martin Luther King is dead. Um, but law enforcement knew it, and some of his advanced staff knew it. So now the conversation is, you got to get the candidate out of there. He, we, he can't come in. Well, Robert Kennedy overrode them. And I'm, they, they had a flatbed, and he was going to speak on that. I'm standing right down in front of it. And he arrived. He got right out of the car. He got up, and he gave the most eloquent and appropriate speech and calmed that crowd and gave them purpose and uh, showed them a better future through Martin Luther King's thinkings. And nothing, nothing bad happened at all. The crowd took it, um, and it just, yeah, it stunned all of us. But it uh, also, that, that, that's probably the only place in the country where any kind of gathering like that didn't turn into something bad. And, and he did that, and to be there at that moment and standing there and now going back into that area and look at the statuary and everything that they have, is, that was, uh, and I didn't realize it totally at the time. It, like the next morning, I'm starting to realize as I'm reading the papers and seeing, was, yeah, that, that was more significant than me just being safe because of something he said. So, uh, so help me out. I'd never heard that term before. You were a stringer. What does that mean? Um, as I worked for a, on occasion a series of stations that I was not a full-time employee, but if I did a report 
and sent it to them, they'd send me 25 bucks or something like that. That's, that's what a stringer was. I'm surprised that you didn't know that. Yeah, I'd, I'd never huh. heard of that one. So. Wow. <laughs> so that's really would, making me old, isn't it? <laughs> you, would go to, um, you would go to an event like that and do a report and then deliver it to multiple stations? Right. Any, uh, anything that was halfway major, major. Plus, at the time, the Associated Press was paying for reports as well. So uh, you could take one story and farm it out four or five different ways. And, you know, make, not make a living per se, but at least not having to beg for well, food. Well, they're just so isolated now. If you're on a network, you don't, you're not dare yeah. seen on another network. Right. So it's pretty cool, again, looking back at how the industry has changed. Yeah. You know, that's true. I, I guess that is true. Another yeah. interesting part of your life, you're very involved in law enforcement. Mm -hmm. And I don't think people realize how deeply involved you are in law enforcement and, and things of that nature. Would you care to well, maybe enhance? Well, I'm involved, or have been. I no longer do it. But I was involved in, in law enforcement training, um, specifically with uh, SWAT, Special Operations Unit for both the FBI Indianapolis office and for the state police. And my, the fun part of that, I, got, I never got paid. I, I got paid by they'd, they'd leave a box of ammunition sitting over here. You know, so <laughs> that's how I got paid. But I, I started out, my, my primary goal or, or uh, assignment was to be the bad guy and recruit bad guys as needed for training exercises. And... It went from just finding people to, hey, we've got this problem keeps occurring and we need to train on, train up on it. Um, but if one of our guys writes it, they'll game it. And so we need you to write it because you don't look at it like it, law enforcement does. You have to come uh, a lot of different other areas of your life that have taught you. You know, I was a really good criminal at one time. <laughs> no. um, and then that, and they realized that I was fairly proficient in both handgun and long, long gun. And so I, I was helping them more and, and more with that, that kind of thing. And uh, um, I'd occasionally, you know, go help them on the rappel tower. And so I loved all that stuff. That's, you know, that was an adventure. And, uh, and it was different than everything else I did. But uh, mostly the, the, enjoyable stuff besides the handgun training and stuff like that was just writing these huge scenarios one of them every year was an all-day deal you know and it might start with a bank robbery here and then the guys run and now are reported here this is all over camp atterbury down uh, down in southern indiana and i i did that and i remember teach they wanted to teach People, their teams were going through the door, but they, they were looking here and there, but they weren't looking up. And we wanted to train them to look up. So we came up with an uh, exercise to be able to do that. And I got a letter maybe eight months later from a guy, an officer in one of the... That's, this was when we were training small departments, uh, the Bureau was. And I got a letter from the guy who said, you know, you just saved my life. Because I looked up and there was a guy hiding up in the uh, in the entrance to the attic, and if I hadn't looked up, I'd be dead now. So, yeah, that's. But it for me, it was it was it was cops and robbers. <laughs> I think we might have to title this show "Little Known Facts About Paul Page." <laughs> we've uh, we've opened up the door to Pandora's box and learned <laughs> some pretty cool stuff here. We're going to take one break here, and we'll be right back on the other side. We're going to talk about his book. Hello, I'm Paul Page. It's race day in Indianapolis. Stay with us. We'll be right back. This segment of The Skinny is brought to you by General Tire. It's more than just a slogan. Anywhere is possible with General Tire. General Tire's Grabber X3 Mud Terrain Tire offers aggressive styling and is engineered for durability with innovative performance features that are ready to carry you through extreme mud, dirt, and rock-covered terrain. For extreme traction that's ready for anything and rugged styling to match, look no further than the Grabber X3. Make your anywhere possible by visiting GeneralTire.com today. 
Welcome back to The Skinny. A great guest here with us this week, Paul Page. Actually, a two-part show. Make sure you check out the first part. This is part two, and we're wrapping things up here. Track dude with us, Michael Young, as well. We've uh, we've been saving this to the very end because we want you people to go out and purchase this book. It is well worth the price of admission for sure. But I want to get you to do the introduction, the title on the book. I want to hear that from your voice. <laughs> Hello, I'm Paul Page, and it's race day in Indianapolis. Brilliant. Goosebumps. <laughs> Goosebumps. Brilliant. You know, it's, it's funny, though. My co-author, uh, uh, Jay Elrod, um, argued over that. He had a whole list of titles that he wanted, and I had that. And he, he would tell me, well, this, this doesn't fit this pattern, or you know, this is the way this is done. He is a great writer, and, and he understood that. But I just felt this was a little different. And that it was it was it was my opening, um, not always said together, but the combination quite often together. And uh, I just I, it seemed right for the book, so we we finally agreed that that would be would be the title. But you know we write this entire book with maybe three serious conversations, and we get to the title, and it's like we can't agree on the title. It's <laughs> it, you know nine words maybe. Do you remember any of the other options? Uh, no, I really don't. Yeah, I really don't. Yeah, there, yeah. It, it gets that we've been in that. Yeah. You know, it gets it, it ties your brain all up. It's like let's just focus on one here and, and move along. But oh my goodness, I mean, it's just so cool to hear to hear you say that. So talk to us about the book. What was the inspiration? Well, it it um, it started that I wanted to write something to my family about what I'd done. That you know they could. I guess a lot of us are doing stuff like that. Um, but then a number of people said, you, you really ought to write a book. And so my answer was, I'll write it when I'm retired. Well, me retiring turned out to be, one, a moving target and uh, kind of vague anyway at, when, it, finally, when I finally decided I couldn't do it anymore. Um, and so I started writing it as a book, and I'd have all these chapters written and all these stories. But I'm a journalistic writer. I, I can do... I, there's some writing I can do like opens to radio shows and TV shows. I, I can write that kind of drama, but I couldn't do the ongoing writing that was had a proper element of uh, of, of color and place and everything. And John called me and, and he said, I'd like to write your book. And okay. And he was able to add... You know, mine would just be fact to fact to fact. And he put in, you know, it was a beautiful morning and, you know, all the different things that gave it life. And uh, after five and a half years with me and two and a half with John, uh, we, finally, we finally got it published. That was a huge day. It's interesting to watch, well, to read the book, but to also see as you start to lay out all the photos of your mm -hmm. life and your career on Facebook, if, if, our watchers, our viewers, our listeners aren't friends with you on Facebook or follow you on Facebook, they should. It's interesting to see the photos mm. that you have put on Facebook these last couple of months or so. What's your favorite? When you go through these photos and you look at some of the memories... You're, you're killing me with this stuff. <laughs> it, it's, but it's so... I didn't realize... I realized how much of this that you did, but it's so neat to see it and your age and, and, and what you had accomplished and to see my heroes, racing heroes and mm -hmm. you as a broadcast hero in the day and the element and being together, it was, it's really quite striking. It's uh, that's, that's a difficult one to pull out much like what was your, your favorite moment. Um, that question as well as this, what might've been important to me and significant to me, isn't necessarily something that you would think was significant at all. Um, my, my personal favorite is the picture of me, Sid Collins and my son, Brian, who was an infant at that time. Um, but that's, you know, personal, emotional. I think my all around that may, maybe the racing public gets as well as I do is, uh, Elio and I hugging in, in the winter circle right after he came down from the platform and, uh, and it was it was totally spontaneous. He and I were friends anyway, uh, and we'd gone through some things together. 
And he saw me and I saw him and it was like, wham, you know, and we're kind of pushing through this crowd to get that done. And uh, what was neat about it has happened again this year. I was waiting downstairs just to congratulate him on what I thought was one of the most incredible races I've ever seen. And uh, he came down the stairs and he still had the wreath on. And he, so he's coming down from up in the elevated platform. And again, he sees me and I take a step or two toward him and there's two security guys. And they're kind of, you know, starting to get, and then they realize he's going for me. And again, we got a nice hug. So I think um, both public and privately, that's, that would be my other favorite picture. But there's so many in there that I really enjoy. And, you know, there's, uh, there's a picture in there uh, that I'm particularly proud of that was taken from the International Space Station. I had a friend who was an astronaut. And so he took a picture of the Speedway out the window. And uh, I have a second one that's not up yet of Texas Speedway that he, he also took. So, and, and there's such a realm of different stuff in there that I kind of like it. And when I find something, I'll stick it up there. And uh, Generally, it's well-received. In fact, I, I haven't gotten a really nasty note on any of it yet. You know, I, fortunately, there's nobody's girlfriend or anything in the back of the pictures. <laughs> what was one break? If you had not had that break, you would not be sitting here today telling these stories. Was it Sid, or was there something else? Uh, no, it was, it was getting hired by WIBC. I wanted to be involved. I was, I was a gopher at, at Patrick Racing for a while, and I just, once I'd seen the 60 race, I, I just wanted to be involved. I didn't care what it was. But going to WIBC put me in the same place that Sid Collins was, and uh, I could learn from him, and also it was a big station, a uh, very important station at the time, and so I could get a little more key out of it, and I certainly learned journalism out of it. So I think all of that is what made that, that important. Of all the things I've done in my lifetime, to say that I was able to work with Paul Page was, it, uh -huh. it was a, one of those notches that I never dreamt it was ever going to be possible. Uh -huh. And to Go be able on. to call you a friend <laughs> and a colleague is, is truly an honor. Uh, you have no idea how much I appreciate that, too. I really do. And professionals, you know, that's... When you're hearing from your own craft, that's that's important. Thank I, you. Uh, I, Thank I you. echo that. We didn't work together, but the opportunity to spend time with you like mm -hmm. this um, is very special. Very early in my career, m before my career, in fact, uh, I had the opportunity to sit down with Chris Economaki, and I literally picked up the phone, called Chris out of the blue. Yeah, he had sure. no clue who I was. And I lived in New Jersey at the time. He was in New Jersey. And I said, hey, I, I'm starting a television career. I was wondering if I might be able to meet with you. Mm -hmm. He said, absolutely, <clears throat> meet me at this diner. And we went and met at this diner because that's where his, his granddaughter was working. Yeah. And, uh, and sat there. And we sat there for an hour, hour and a half. I mean, for a man like that to take the time to talk to somebody. That was Chris. That was, know, he, he always had time for anybody. Uh, remember, he started his career selling newspapers at racetracks, um, but he ought to be in that icon with Tom. Oh, and, absolutely, yes. And, uh, and Sid. Um, and he helped everybody I ever saw. Uh, I, yeah, I'd see kids in the crowd, you know, come up, Mr. Economac. He, he had the time, and he was, he was cool. He was very cool. He was super cool for sure. And then I did have the pleasure of working with Bob Jenkins for a little bit in short yeah. course off-road. So, uh, yeah, Nicest man ever. Yeah. Work, uh, working with you guys, um, you know, and I know it can feel awkward. As, as you sit there, I've had people come to me and say, you know, it's, it's really great to work with you. And it can, it can feel a little awkward. Mm -hmm. I get it. And It's never so happened to me. In case <laughs> <laughs> Um, we, we certainly don't mean to put you on the spot that way, but you're a big part of our lives yes. and mm -hmm. you're a big part of this country's, um, moments of history and, uh, and, and you deserve to be in that group of iconic broadcasters. Mm -hmm. And, uh, we can't thank you enough for all the memories. Thank you. I, I don't really think of it that way, but thank you for thinking of it that way. Yeah. I just, I just a kid who I followed my passion, which is a lot of what the book is about. Yeah. Uh, and ended up living my own dream. So, but I, and, I, and I say in the book, at the start of it, there's a letter that I got from Eddie Sachs after having written him, and I, I said maybe I could do something. And, and his answer was, essentially, if you want to do it, you have the passion, go for it. That was, and I just always went that way. 
and I, I want to touch on this real quick. We've got to wrap things up here, I know. But, but to me, one of the biggest payoffs in this career is what you talked about with Alio. Those are true mm-hmm. relationships, true friendships, and that's what develops, fortunately for us in our careers, is these, these people who, who are uh, superstars and heroes to the rest of the world in terms of racing drivers, but they become our close friends. Mm-hmm. And it's those special moments where you get to walk up and you have, you have just a person-to-person hug like that yeah. as a true friend, and it happens to be one of the greatest of all times. It's, yeah. It doesn't get any better. It's part, no, but it's part of the family, too. Yeah. No, it doesn't get any better than that. Absolutely. Yeah. That A.J. Foyt would wave at you. You know, yeah. that's, wow. Yeah. That's exactly right. <laughs> that's my double throwdown hero, and he's waving at me. <laughs> <laughs> Great stuff. Great times here with Paul Page. Remember, a two-part show here, so this is part two. Check out part one as well. Go on Amazon.com. Hello, I'm Paul Page. It's Race Day in Indianapolis is the title of the book. Just hit buy it now, and it'll be at your door in a couple of days, and I promise you, you'll enjoy the book. Thank you so much, Paul. We appreciate it. I can't thank you guys enough. This has been a lot of fun. I appreciate it. That's it. We'll see you next time on The Skinny. Thanks for being with us here on The Skinny. This episode has been brought to you by Toyota, Rhino Classifieds, Dream Giveaway, and General Tire. For the latest in sunglasses, optical frames, accessories, and apparel, be sure to check out fatheads.com. That's fatheads with a Z. Production facilities provided by Fatheads Eyewear Studios. All rights reserved.